For many, Mars has long beckoned as the so-called next logical destination after the moon. Accordingly, NASA has been spending a lot of time over the past months talking about the so-called road to Mars. It sounds very appealing to those who want to go to Mars, or rather, in most cases, send someone else to Mars. Last summer, the National Research Council put out a report that described decades of expenditure of tens of billions of taxpayer dollars that would culminate in sending a few civil servants to the surface of the red planet sometime in the next half century. It was like Apollo again, except taking much longer than before the decade was out. In addition, its budget recommendations were viewed by many as unrealistic. In its recommendations, it didn't consider the possibility of space settlement, of Mars or anywhere else, because it could not reach a consensus on whether such a thing was even possible. For many, the report was dismaying. The road to Mars had become pathways to Mars, and it seemed more like a slow dirt road full of potholes and ruts than a superhighway. The Planetary Society in particular was frustrated and sponsored a workshop this past spring to discuss an effort by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the Aerospace Corporation to come up with a more aggressive plan. There they announced the outlines of it, though details won't be released until later. It managed to accelerate the program to a visit to Mars orbit in the early 2030s and a landing late in that decade without dramatic budget increases. While an improvement, it still didn't exactly seem to be a Mars rush. The real problem with both the NRC report and the Planetary Society initiative is that they accept continual NASA propaganda that the space launch system and the Orion capsule, so coveted by Congress, are a key element of that vaunted road to Mars. For example, when Orion had a test flight of a prototype in December, there was a great deal of talk about its supposed role in a Mars mission, despite the fact that it has never been designed as a Mars vehicle. It is too small by itself for such a long journey in terms of crew psychology, it doesn't have adequate room for consumables, and its heat shield is not designed to come back as fast as a Mars mission would require, being sized only for a lunar return of barely escape velocity. The fatal flaw in both the NRC report and the JPL aerospace plans was the politically correct acceptance of the SLS and Orion as critical elements on the road to Mars. But the reality is that to the degree they are on the road, they are actually a roadblock. As long as we persist in falsely believing them necessary, not only will we put off plans to go, but they will continue to divert resources from those elements that truly are on a path not just to Mars, but to opening up the whole solar system. Like the Saturn V, the vast majority of payload on the SLS is propellant because typically over 70% of any mission beyond low Earth orbit consists of propellant, particularly when there is no ability to refuel at the destination. But propellant can be divided up into arbitrarily small packages to be launched on smaller, cheaper rockets. Also, as a payload, it is very low cost on Earth compared to space hardware, so the need for reliability of a propellant delivery mission is low. NASA has never identified any particular payload or mission requirement that demands a vehicle with the capabilities of the SLS. Its capabilities were not defined by any particular designated mission, but by congressional fiat. For deep space missions, rather than attempting to put everything up in a single launch, as we did on Apollo, it is much more cost effective to store propellant on orbit, topping up storage facilities with a number of small launches. This not only saves money, but provides a market for multiple launch providers spurring competition and driving costs down ever further. The most expensive way to get propellant to orbit is on a single flight of a giant rocket. As an example, an internal trade study at NASA over three years ago, revealed by the NASA Watch website, showed that the cost of a single lunar mission could be cut by more than half by using multiple SpaceX Falcon Heavy flights, shown in the first bar, rather than the almost $8 billion for the space launch system, shown in the far right one. A Mars mission with much greater lift requirements would doubtless display much greater cost savings. But Congress hasn't gotten the message. In the most recent markup this spring, the House Appropriations Committee once again cut the budget for commercial crew needed to end our dependence on the Russians for access to space by almost a quarter of a billion dollars. It also cut a hundred million from the technology budget needed to reduce the future cost of exploration and it added almost 500 million more than requested to the SLS budget. While I'd argue that any amount of money spent on SLS is wasted, this is particularly wasteful. It won't accelerate the program, and no program manager knows how to effectively spend half a billion dollars that is suddenly dumped in his or her lap. But assuming that this doesn't get fixed in the final appropriations bill, the money will be spent in the states and districts of the members of the space committees in Congress, and that's all they really care about. 
The purpose of this Kickstarter project is to lay some of the groundwork for ending this misallocation of resources by providing an example of how much faster, less expensively, and effectively we could be getting to Mars using NASA's expected budget if we weren't forced politically to waste billions on things we don't need for that. Part of the roadblock to Mars is the false perception that SLS and Orion are necessary to get there. Fixing this perception is the first step toward clearing the road. With an open highway ahead, not just Mars, but the solar system itself will finally beckon humanity to open, develop, and fill it with life.